exclusively dedicated to investing in early stage cutting edge healthcare companies. BioVerge's investment thesis is focused on companies spanning the intersection of health tech, health and tech that are utilizing advances in technology to modernize healthcare from bench to bedside. Previously, Neil was vice president of business development at Notable Labs, an oncology startup and BioVerge portfolio company where he led the development of global corporate partnerships and contributed to the strategic vision of Notable as part of the senior leadership team. He oversaw business development through the successful completion of the company's 40 million Series B. And previously, he was a member of the executive leadership team and director of business development at California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Prior to CIRM, he was a healthcare investment banker at Thomas Wiesel Partners and Dutch Bank and worked on transactions totaling over 1 billion. His primary focus was on strategic advisory in public and private financings. Neil received a master's of science in biotech from Johns Hopkins University. So welcome and uh, please take it away. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen here and I will get started. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, thanks everyone. I am thrilled to be here today. Uh, a huge thank you to uh, the Brain Foundation uh, for the invitation. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about what we're building at BioVerge and how it's relevant uh, to the early stage uh, funding ecosystem. So before I jump into uh, details of BioVert, I, I'm just really happy and, and thrilled to announce a, a collaboration between us and, and the Brain Foundation. And, and the goal of this collaboration is really to accelerate the pace of investment into companies that are working on developing uh, technologies for children and adults with autism. And so by joining forces, we really believe we can help democratize access, enable more people to invest in and support the causes that matter most to all of us. Um, I think how we're going to accomplish this should become clear as I move through this, uh, this presentation, but we're really excited about this, uh, this collaboration. Uh, I will probably just kind of gloss over this slide <laughs> since uh, my background was, was already highlighted in, in the introduction. I don't want to uh, don't want to bore people. I do uh, just briefly want to say that I, I think you know, given my background both in uh, finance and, and particularly healthcare investment banking, uh, and then really more relevant at the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, I think has really led to. Uh, what I believe is was sort of the inevitable creation of BioVert. Um, you know, I think it was all roads of my career sort of converged to a point of what I'm doing today. And I'm going to share with you uh, a story from my time at, at CIRM, which really served as my inspiration for starting BioVert. And I think really speaks to the why, as in why do we exist today um, and, and what, what BioVerge is, is, is all about. Um, this, this, this example is not from the, the autism space, but you know, I, I think it really gets to the heart of what we are trying to do at, at BioVerge and why we exist. So when I was at, uh, at, at CIRM, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, uh, I got to know a little girl by the name of Evie and her family. Uh, Evie and her parents would come to CIRM board meetings uh, and talk about her experience being treated with a, a gene therapy that we were funding while I was at CERN. It was, uh, it was out of a lab at UCLA. Uh, Evie was born with SCID or severe combined immunodeficiency. Children born with SCID have a life expectancy of about 20 to 25 years old and uh, because they don't have a functioning immune system are frequently in and out of the hospital with severe infections. Uh, at the age of one, uh, Evie was, was treated with, with the gene therapy. Uh, this, this gene therapy replaced the defective copy of the gene responsible for causing her disease. You know, fast forward to when I met her and she, she was about six years old and, and she is now cured. Uh, she goes to school. She has a dog. She lives a, a normal life. Uh, so I would you know, naturally go get very excited and tell my friends and my family and really anyone who would listen about this amazing little girl who I met at CIRM and this amazing research that we were funding. And without doubt, without a doubt, everyone sounded, everyone said it sounded like science fiction. But it wasn't, it was science fact. Uh, and, and to round out the story, the intellectual property was subsequently spun out of UCLA into a biotech company that went public over, at, over uh, with, with a valuation of over a billion dollars, which meant that early stage investors in their seed and series A rounds did very well for themselves. They made returns in the order of 14 to 20 X 
cash on cash. And the company went from inception to IPO in the span of less than three years. So I thought, why can't more of us invest in these incredible type of technologies and help bring science fiction to life and benefit from the financial returns associated with these investments? And so that's really what I have built Bioverse to do and what Bioverse is all about. So we are structured to enable investors, uh, really largely individual investors, to participate in early stage, high quality healthcare investments for the purpose of generating outsized financial returns while also making an impact on people's lives. At Bioverse, we do not believe these two things are mutually exclusive. So there's a couple of ways that, that uh, our members or our investors invest with us. Uh, so folks can invest through our corporate entity, uh, I sort of call it our mothership, or, 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 um, which is analogous to owning uh, what is akin to a general partnership stake uh, in our firm. Um, I'll just throw out that we are conducting a regulation crowdfunding offering currently where we are raising capital for Bioverse to scale our business and, and our platform. Uh, the other way that folks invest with us is through special purpose vehicles. These types of, of special purpose vehicles or SPVs are, um, are spun up to invest in specific startup companies. And I'll talk a little more about that uh, in another slide or two, but our members can opt in to invest in specific companies that fit with their investment thesis, their investment mandate, or that are trying to tackle you know, different diseases or conditions that they may care about. Uh, the other way that folks invest with us are through what we call our multi-company access funds. Uh, these are diverse, diversified funds that invest in a portfolio of 10 to 15 companies. Um, the one other way, which I'll mention, which actually is not on the slide, is we also recently launched a regulation crowdfunding portal. So we work with early stage startup companies and help them raise capital uh, from both accredited and non-accredited investors through our funding portal. We have a couple of clients that we're working with now uh, through there. And again, that speaks to our mission of democratizing access. Uh, I do just briefly want to touch on our, uh, our portfolio to give you an idea of what we've done. So I'll move through this relatively quickly, but we, we've deployed about 5.5 million uh, over the last five years. We've built a portfolio of 29 companies. Uh, we've actually completed 45 deals. So that includes uh, some follow-on rounds for our portfolio companies. That includes two access funds that we've closed. Uh, we have three exits, uh, so that means three of our portfolio companies have been acquired. Uh, two have been acquired in the last six months alone. Uh, currently, we have a 0% loss ratio, and that, what that means is all of our portfolio companies are still operating. We have no failures or no write-downs in our portfolio. I will just say that we're not perfect. That, that stat is not going to hold, uh, but we're enjoying it now, and it does, it does speak to uh, our diligence process to some extent. Um, I'll briefly just touch on two of our most recent exits because I, I feel like these sort of highlight what we're going for. The, the, the first exit uh, occurred earlier this summer. It was a company by the name of Echo Labs in our portfolio that was a, that we invested in at a $10 million valuation. Uh, they were acquired by Sellink for $110 million uh, in June of this year uh, to Bioverge that represented a, 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 about an eight and a half uh, multiple uh, cash on cash return. Uh, the second company that was acquired uh, earlier this fall was Volumetric, which is involved in the 3D uh, tissue printing space. Uh, they, they 3D print some vasculature associated with, with various organs. They were bought by uh, 3D Systems uh, for a $45 million upfront payment plus up to another $355 million in milestone payments. So our return is not set yet. Uh, the worst we're going to do is based on the upfront payment, which is about an 8x cash on cash return, and we could go all the way up to about an 80x return, depending if the milestones are hit or not. Um, I, I, I do want to touch on the rest of our portfolio. You know, this is admittedly a very busy slide, but we are not in the volume game. We are in the business of generating high quality investment opportunities for our investors. We do operate across various sub verticals within healthcare, uh, but the common theme you'll see across our portfolio is our companies are all enabled by a stack of technology, whether it's artificial intelligence or machine learning, or there's a big data component, um, and of course, right here, here you will see uh, BioRosa is one of our portfolio companies that we are extremely excited about. I believe uh, John Slatterly, the CEO, is, is speaking right after me, so I don't want to steal John's thunder. Uh, but I will say that BioRosa is developing a blood test with the potential to, to detect autism in children as young as 18 months. And uh, we've been really excited about the team's progress uh, since we first invested. 
Uh, again, I, I, I won't steal John's thunder, so I'll let him talk. But I will say, you know, if you zoom out it, across our portfolio, uh, we do have a number of other investments in the in the neuro space. Um, so this is an area of focus for us. Uh, you know, I think importantly, we gain access and allow our investors to invest alongside not just us, but other top tier and top decile VC firms out there. These are many names that most of you have probably heard about. The, the, the one comment I will make is that our key to getting into super high quality deals is very simply that we provide a lot of value add support to our portfolio companies. Um, I clearly can't do this alone. Uh, so I do want to mention two other folks on my team who, are, frankly, are much smarter than I am and, and who are instrumental in our mission and our success. Uh, Rick Gibb is my co-founder. He has over 12 years of experience. He spent the better part of his career at Stanford University. Um, he was in their tech transfer office for a number of years. And then more recently, he was uh, working out of the office of the CFO managing Stanford's uh, venture fund. So he was evaluating uh, Stanford-led investments into uh, IP that was being spun out of Stanford, specifically in the healthcare vertical. Uh, Marianne Santaguida is a PhD trained scientist. She's been in the trenches at a variety of startups, most notably at Stemcentrics, which was developing antibody drug conjugate uh, that was acquired for Advi for uh, $6 billion, uh, uh, probably about six years ago at this point. Uh, none of us are new to this. We've all worked together in various capacities for the last five years. Um, so uh, we have a lot of deep domain expertise. Uh, and finally, I'll just I'll just wrap. Um, and, and, you know, I'd like to close with how you can learn more. Obviously, you know, reach out to the Brain Foundation and, 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 and their team at this conference through their website. Uh, you can reach out to, to BioVerge uh, through our website. We have a, a bi-monthly newsletter. Uh, we do some webinars and things like that. So I'll provide my contact information uh, on the last slide here. Would love to hear from people. Um, and so I think there's a number of ways for folks to get involved in, in what we're doing and would, would love to hear from you. So I will just uh, quickly put up our legal disclaimer and uh, I would be more than happy to take any questions. There may be some questions on Q and A, so we can, um, if you can look at that and respond, that would be great. Uh, we'll okay. move on to the next speaker. Okay, actually, I will do that. Thank you so much. It is my uh, privilege to once again welcome um, John Slattery. His talk will be about his metabolic autism, autism prediction study for Shannon Rose and others as part of a multidisciplinary autism research group focused on novel therapeutic strengths for ASD, along with biomarker discovery work on putative etiological and pathophysiological factors underlying ASD. John was involved in over 35 highly cited peer reviewed articles on ASD dedicated to this work. The ACH team's most significant achievement at the time was conducting one of the only positive phase two clinical trials that investigated a novel intervention, which was built the first positive precision medicine initiative in neuropsychiatry. He has extensive ties to the aut autism clinical research and patient community and a wide knowledge base of ASD from a clinical scientific and business perspective. And he was at ACH, he was a personal manager for the autism program and managed a team of 10 and was the director of autism translational research under Dr. Richard Fry. Um, John also joined a software startup company in 2017 where he was in charge of sales and R&D. So with that, um, I will welcome John, please take it away. Thanks Pramila. Um, doesn't look like, there we go. Now I can share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So thank you, Pramila and the Brain Foundation so much for uh, the opportunity to uh, talk here today. 
and uh, thank you for the kind and wonderful introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to give some brief background on BioRosa Technologies, uh, as well as uh, a recently launched clinical trial uh, that we are in process of uh, enrolling participants for uh, that's entitled a Metabolic Autism Prediction Study. Uh, this study is a multi-center, prospective, double-blind case-controlled trial uh, assessing specific metabolic abnormalities for prediction of autism against the current gold standard in children that are uh, looking for a first-time diagnosis that are currently on a, a wait list uh, to see a developmental uh, pediatrician. Uh, everyone here is probably very familiar with uh, the autism uh, prevalence rates uh, prevalence rates and costs to society. So I won't belabor too much of this, but for those who aren't uh, or are new to the, the field or just trying to learn, uh, the CDC just updated their recent um, autism prevalence rates just last week uh, to show that children uh, with autism are believed to be about one in 44 children uh, in this country, which is a roughly 241% increase uh, since uh, the year 2000. Uh, unfortunately, since the autism rates appear to continue to be going up, uh, there's no FDA cleared treatments for autism. The average wait times for uh, receiving a diagnosis uh, continue to uh, unfortunately lead to uh, many delays. Uh, the cost to society uh, is also uh, skyrocketing as well. Uh, this uh, graphic to the right was uh, a recent publication by Dr. Richard Fry. Uh, and a few others uh, showing uh, estimated cost to society and uh, what that could mean over time uh, for caring for children with autism and cost to the healthcare system overall. So uh, for those who may not be familiar with uh, how autism is diagnosed and treated today, uh, it is uh, diagnosed through time consuming, expensive one-on-one -on -one evaluations between a child and a specially trained therapist. Uh, just for context, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, has recommended universal autism screenings as early as 18 and 24 month uh, well baby visits. However, uh, due to uh, rising uh, autism prevalence, as well as limited number of practitioners and many other factors, uh, unfortunately, the average age of diagnosis is still uh, four and a half uh, years of age and older. Um, and that's problematic uh, just because uh, the reason we really wanna get children into services uh, much earlier, just like anything in medicine with early detection uh, can lead to early intervention. Uh, and really uh, the 18 to 24 month uh, time uh, frame could lead towards uh, taking advantage of neuroplasticity windows uh, that are still uh, quite open. If we could you know, intervene even earlier than that, great, uh, but there's some uh, practical reasons why that's uh, not possible today, given the current uh, behavioral uh, diagnostic paradigm. Uh, to make uh, a complicated and um, multi-layered problem worse, uh, and it's just like every industry, uh, COVID-19 really starts uh, exposing uh, even more holes uh, in, in all areas of uh, in every industry. But uh, for autism, uh, given that uh, diagnosis is made through one-on-one -on -one evaluations between child and a therapist, uh, the, the autism diagnostic test uh, that is the gold, considered the gold standard, the ADOS, uh, if clinicians are wearing PPE and things of that sort, uh, the test was not validated, of course, uh, to uh, assess children uh, while they're wearing, while clinicians are wearing PPE, which makes matters complicated. Uh, and then since uh, behavioral therapy involves one-on-one -on -one interactions to try and uh, get children to uh, uh, learn different ways of uh, uh, changing their behavior through uh, um, uh, interactions with therapists. Uh, since those, uh, you know, sort of interactions didn't happen at the rates they normally would, uh, unfortunately, uh, children uh, in terms of diagnosis um, were not being diagnosed at the rates they normally would. Uh, and the diagnosis that are happening are problematic due to the PPE, et cetera, and the therapy that children are receiving uh, was also compromised uh, as well. So um, many problems uh, in terms of the current uh, behavioral and treatment paradigm. So, you know, we all are aware that, you know, we need to try and do something uh, to move the field forward and to try and uh, solve many of these problems. And that's why at Biorosa, we're looking to try and develop, uh, we hope to be uh, a universal blood test that can be used for early detection of autism uh, through assessing uh, very specific uh, metabolic abnormalities. 
Uh, this is not a theory or hypothesis that Bayerosa uh, developed a, as a company. Uh, this was something that uh, Dr. Jill James, Richard Fry, and others that I worked with at Arkansas Children's from 2010 to 2017 helped open my eyes towards. And then uh, really that work is still ongoing, but um, a lot of Jill's work that she has done over the years was uh, retrospective. It didn't really look uh, in terms of trying to uh, develop a diagnostic test for autism. Uh, there was uh, considered uh, somewhat of a breakthrough in 2017 when uh, Jill's data uh, that assessed metabolic abnormalities in children with autism uh, was provided to Jurgen Hahn at RPI in Troy, New York, in which Jurgen uh, looked to see if he could train some computer code uh, and develop a machine learning algorithm that could differentiate autism uh, from non-autism cases. Uh, and this, uh, in the studies that Jurgen did, he looked at autism versus typically developing as well as uh, siblings of children with autism and saw that he could, uh, the computer algorithms could differentiate autism from the other groups with close to 90% accuracy. Uh, given that that was pretty remarkable um, and that, you know, there was still some work that needed to be done in order to clinically validate these things and try and uh, develop uh, a clinical and commercial grade assay. Uh, Bayerosa uh, incorporated as a company in 2018. Uh, we had some technical challenges that we had to overcome uh, based on uh, some of the limitations of the academic work uh, in terms of uh, the laboratory uh, techniques that were used uh, in, in, in the academic uh, labs uh, wouldn't necessarily be uh, sensitive or suitable for large scale uh, commercial assays. So we had to develop something uh, and, and we successfully validated our laboratory approaches. And then we also realized that um, given that we're dealing with uh, metabolites, which we'll get to in a few minutes, uh, they're involved in redox metabolism. Uh, we knew that they were highly reactive and unstable. So we had to figure out uh, new stability protocols to try and make sure that we could uh, not have a, uh, as we use in software, a garbage in, garbage out sort of uh, data process and actually ensure that we have a good quality signal uh, of the data. So Byrosa uh, accomplished those goals uh, and our team innovated uh, over the past few years and we're fortunate to get to a point where we just recently, uh, right before Thanksgiving, uh, launched our prospective double blind study, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. So what we are doing is uh, hoping to develop what we consider a, uh, what we'd hope to be a universal screening test for autism that we would hope to detect uh, autism as early as 18 months. Uh, if we could get to a point where we could detect even earlier, great. Uh, but given that uh, the current behavioral um, testing through the ADOS and other behavioral uh, tech, uh, diagnostic uh, instruments um, are, are lower bound age limit, at, at least starting off in order to try and show a correlation with the gold standard uh, needs to start uh, with how we can currently diagnose things, diagnose autism today. So uh, we are targeting 18 months uh, of age as our uh, starting point, uh, as many companies in this space or anyone that's trying to develop uh, new biomarkers or early detection uh, techniques for autism, we, we all deal with the same sort of problem. Uh, so we all start around the same uh, age range to start. Uh, so we uh, basically do what we do through collecting a small sample of blood uh, from children in a standard uh, phlebotomy uh, uh, setting. We are able to stabilize the blood through some proprietary ways in which Bayerosa has developed uh, stabilization uh, techniques of our analytes of interest. Uh, the data gets shipped to our laboratory uh, up in the Boston area in which we've developed a, a liquid chromatography triple mass spec, uh, fancy words, uh, just a laboratory uh, uh, approach to being able to analyze the analytes of interest. And then those analytes, uh, once we have uh, our trial completed, uh, end up going to bioinformatics to train an algorithm. And then we have a holdout set uh, in which we validate the algorithm against uh, our remaining set of samples. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit later. Uh, based on uh, the historic research that was conducted at Arkansas Children's uh, through Jill, Jurgen, Richard, and others, uh, the current data has shown that uh, the validation algorithms are performing at close to 90% accuracy in terms of differentiating autism spectrum disorder uh, versus non-autism spectrum disorder, and that is uh, looking at uh, siblings as well as typically developing children. Uh, 
what really needs to be done and why we're doing the clinical study that we're doing is that um, we need to do this in a prospective double blind study against the current gold standard. Uh, this slide just gives a little bit uh, more context into uh, starting with targeted met met metabolic uh, analyses, uh, looking at problems in uh, one carbon folate mediated metabolism in their branch chain. That's really what Jill uh, initially uh, focused on, uh, in which we saw problems in glutathione redox uh, metabolism, problems in the methylation capacity of the cell. Uh, folate, uh, we've known folate super important for neurodevelopment for quite some time. Uh, and then certain and through some of Richard's work, as well as others, uh, we found uh, biomarkers of uh, mitochondrial metabolism as well that also uh, may be abnormal in children with autism compared to uh, other, other children. Uh, and this just really kind of breaks down why we need to uh, be better at allowing for early development. Uh, you can see that uh, where the black line is for the current age of autism diagnos diagnosis, we've really missed out on many of these key areas of neurodevelopment in which these skills uh, are being developed by, by young infants. Um, young infants are able to uh, develop these skills and be able to uh, actually have uh, significant responses to certain therapies if we're able to uh, get children into therapies uh, early enough. Uh, but you can see that unfortunately these, uh, these windows are closing and uh, that if children are diagnosed here, uh, unfortunately uh, they've missed out on those early intervention windows in which they may have a uh, profound response to therapy. Uh, we do know that not all children have a dramatic response to uh, behavioral intervention. Uh, and that's why we really need to not only develop uh, and validate clinical biomarkers for early detection, uh, but our company is hopeful that we can also leverage these biomarkers to help aid in uh, novel therapeutics that are under development as well. Uh, but in order to get to those uh, lofty goals, we need to start uh, and prove out uh, this hypothesis that redox uh, mediated abnormalities uh, can be predictive of autism versus not autism. Uh, and what we mean by not autism is children that are referred to a developmental uh, pediatrics clinic for an evaluation of autism because it's believed that they, they may uh, have the condition, but they're found to have other developmental uh, 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 problems that are not actually autism spectrum disorder, which is really the true test, right? So if we really believe that uh, redox mediated abnormalities are predictive of autism, we need to show that it's predictive of autism spectrum and not just predictive of uh, general uh, developmental concerns in children. Uh, that study has never been done. Uh, and so Byrosa is the first to look at uh, this, uh, looking at redox mediated abnormalities and one carbon folate uh, related uh, metabolic disturbances for prediction of autism. And we're very excited about the clinical trial that we just launched. And we are doing this in a prospective double blind manner. Why? Uh, we found uh, through our work uh, as well as uh, some uh, collaborators that um, samples that uh, we've looked at that what we consider retrospective uh, in terms of children that had been uh, involved in autism clinical trials uh, post diagnosis that were in a, a biobank. Uh, we see that uh, if samples are not preserved in certain ways, um, they uh, are are. Uh, very compromised uh, in terms of being able to assess uh, problems in redox. So we realized that we needed to, uh, moving forward, uh, develop ways in which we stabilize uh, biomarkers of interest to where we have a good quality clean signal that has not been compromised uh, moving forward. Uh, for this particular study, uh, we consider success to be uh, differentiating autism from uh, non-autism as defined by uh, DSM-5 and ADOS criteria with at least 80% separation. And we're also doing, as we'll see in a few minutes, uh, many other uh, cognitive behavioral and, and medical assessments of the children to see if we can look at uh, correlations with our autism risk score uh, with other aspects of development, such as the Vineland uh, the Mullins, which is, uh, can look at receptive expressive language and also give uh, a surrogate of, of IQ, uh, as well as uh, a few other uh, psychometric tests. 
this just really breaks down uh, what I've just stated and more of a um, graphic display. Um, all children that come in to the study from a pediatric wait list will be assessed through gold standard criteria using ADOS, DSM-5, the Mullins, Vineland, and so on and so forth uh, to either have a gold standard confirmed ASD or not ASD. Uh, we'll realize that those children will have uh, another form of developmental concern, or maybe those children, uh, the parents weren't worried, uh, but the child may actually be, it may have been a, what we consider a worried well, where the child is actually uh, found to be typically developing and not have uh, uh, any problems. Then we also have another group of typically developing children that we're recruiting uh, at our uh, clinic up in Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we, def we define typically developing as children that have no history of developmental uh, behavioral or clinical problems. Uh, the age range for the children in the study is 18 to 60 months. Uh, and so far, uh, we have uh, completed uh, our first few patients that have been enrolled, and we look forward to having a few more before the holidays and, you know, things are really uh, picking up for what we've scheduled for January, uh, which is pretty exciting. So in addition to all the standard clinical evaluations uh, that are done on the children, uh, we're also drawing a small amount of blood. Uh, on the kids as well. And the goal is to uh, see if our uh, metabolite panel uh, that looks at problems in redox, mitochondrial dysfunction, folate metabolism uh, can be predictive of autism as compared to the gold standard. And again, uh, success for this particular pilot study uh, is considered 80% uh, accurate or, or greater. This just breaks down the schedule of events for the participants. Uh, you can see that on the left, uh, for children that are receiving an ASD evaluation. Uh, there are two clinics. Uh, one uh, is our site um, out in Arizona at the Melmed Center in collaboration with the Southwest Autism Research and Resource Center, or SARC. Um, that is uh, our Arizona site. And then we also have Vanderbilt University um, that's also uh, another clinical site. All children will receive the same uh, evaluations and collect a little bit of blood. And then we also have typically developing children, a uh, small cohort of 50 typically developing uh, that we just verify uh, as uh, TD uh, through uh, a few different uh, evaluations. Um, we'll also look to see, as I said previously, uh, whether there's correlations between uh, some of these other tests um, uh, and behavior, but that's TBD. Uh, nothing that we do uh, in our lab uh, would be possible without our phenomenal scientific team. Uh, I am not a scientist or clinician, uh, and I have much smarter people that are, have been able to uh, innovate in our lab and just truly, uh, it's outstanding work. They've been able to uh, achieve some very complex uh, technical milestones uh, that a lot of people thought before we started this company wouldn't even be possible. Um, so the tenacity of this team and the dedication to try and uh, develop uh, an assay that can uh, be predictive of autism in early life is, is I thank Marie, uh, who is my co-founder and CSO, um, uh, for her leadership uh, from the, the laboratory side of things. And Sanjeev Vajresa is our mass spec chemist that has just done an outstanding job. Uh, we have uh, a bunch of advisors and you know, people that help us in many key ways uh, in the study or in, for the company, uh, and I won't go into the great detail, but we've got a tremendous team uh, that assist us uh, across the board. Uh, special thanks to the Brain Foundation, uh, the families that are taking part in our clinical studies, our academic collaborators at RPI, Melmed Center, Vanderbilt, uh, Medical Mine, uh, for, for their help in terms of uh, the EDC, our investors. Uh, personally, special thanks to uh, Richard Fry and Jill James, who without uh, their um, support of me, I wouldn't have been able to, to be where I am uh, in my professional career. So I'm forever indebted to them. Uh, and for the patients that you know, we saw at Arkansas Children's Hospital for uh, you know, the seven and a half years that I was there, uh, I made a commitment uh, to those families that I would never waver uh, and try to do something uh, impactful uh, for the ASD community. And, you know, I was true to my word on that. And, you know, I thank you guys for always uh, believing in, in this work that, that Richard and his group continues to do, but also what we're attempting to do here at Bio Rosa. Um, 
our children and families deserve better uh, outcomes. We need an improved standard of care. We need better ways of trying to address the, the myriad uh, set of problems uh, that are uh, unfortunately leaving uh, me and the children out in the cold. Um, so uh, at Byrosa, we're trying to do our small part in order to improve certain aspects of a complex set of problems. And I thank you guys for your attention and uh, for the ability to uh, speak to you here today. So with that, I'll turn back over to Pramila. So the next speaker is not here yet. That would be Mark. Um, instead. So Pramila, did you want me to yes. do the introduction? Okay. Um, so uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen O'Quinn joining us for our next session. Uh, Dr. O'Quinn is a PharmD and senior pharmaceutical executive with over 30 years of experience in clinical development, medical affairs, and commercialization of medicines and multiple therapy areas, including neurology and psychiatry. Uh, Dr. Quinn will be giving updates on uh, ZOIN002, which is a cannabidiol treatment uh, for autism and fragile X. And prior to joining uh, Zynerba, uh, Dr. O'Quinn spent over 20 years at GSK and has had an uh, extensive career uh, in uh, developing uh, cl clinical uh, uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. O'Quinn and uh, look forward to your presentation. Thank you, John. Let me... Let me share my screen as appropriate. <laughs> Apologies, as it's not um, showing up like it should. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, it uh, didn't do the normal typical way, but let me put it in slide view and we'll begin. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to present today. I, I've truly uh, enjoyed what I've listened to so far, and I appreciate the Brain Foundation's efforts to pull this together to help advance uh, the care and understanding of aut autism and helping families with, and individuals with autism. As John said, today I'm going to talk about some research that we've done at Cenerba Pharmaceuticals, um, specifically around Zen002, which is a cannabidiol dial treatment in a transdermal gel form. And I'll walk you through that information, tell you a little bit more about um, what we're doing and some of the findings we found in some of our early work, and we continue. A disclaimer here, obviously, uh, Zen002 is still an experimental treatment. Um, it's not intended to promote uh, the use of Zen02 or cannabidiol in this instance. Obviously, we're still in clinical trials, and this information is being shared really to advance the understanding of, of what is going on in the field with our therapies and our products. In terms of background, obviously, the the this is an informed audience. You understand what autism spectrum disorder is. Um, as you know, I'm also talking about autism spectrum disorder in the context of fragile X syndrome as well. Uh, fragile X syndrome is the most common monogenic uh, cause of autism spectrum disorder. So I'll be presenting some data from both um, a study in autism spectrum disorder patients without fragile X syndrome, and then also um, with comorbid fragile X uh, syndrome as a diagnosis. Um, as many have said before me, that unfortunately, uh, as we continue to try to press forward, there's only been two FDA approved medicines uh, for the treatment of the symptoms and, and core symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. And those uh, were specifically atypical um, antipsychotics for the treatment of irritability. Um, and our research is looking at what happens when you uh, impact the endocannabinoid system with cannabidiol. And so the background uh, for those who may not have awareness, the endocannabinoid system is a key modulator of emotion and social behavior and is dysregulated in ASD and Fragile X syndrome. Uh, we're learning more and more every day, but, um, but for example, in Fragile X syndrome, we know that um, the 
endocannabinoid system basically is a homeostatic type system. It helps our body and brain regulate what's going on within uh, the neurochemistry, also in development. And that system is uh, significantly impacted uh, because of the lack and uh, because of the genetic uh, challenges within Fragile X uh, syndrome. And so we continue to explore exactly what may be happening there, but we know, uh, again, it plays an important role. And then we know from cannabidiol, uh, we're becoming more familiar and probably uh, many on this call are, are thinking about uh, cannabidiol as it's been in the news uh, a lot in the last couple of years. It is the main non euphoric uh, component of the cannabis plant, and it may provide therapeutic benefit in ASD and fragile X through its effects on the endocannabinoid system. And specifically, you might wonder what, how is Zen002 made and what how does it differ from what might be available uh, currently in many uh, states over the counter? Well, actually, Zen002 is a pharmaceutically produced cannabidiol, so it's not plant derived. Um, it is actually uh, pharmaceutically produced, and the doses that we're using in our trials are significantly greater than, um, than you would be able to typically purchase, or you'd be using a lot of uh, CBD if you were purchased over the counter. The other important thing to, to know about this formulation is it actually uh, has penetration enhancers to help the absorption. If you were just to use cannabidiol itself, it would not be absorbed through your skin. And so it does require additional ab absorption enhancers, even if it's taken orally. So that's um, some things just in background for context um, for why we're studying um, the formulation that we have, uh, Zen002. We've done and have ongoing four trials uh, that have included or will include patients that have autism spectrum disorder. I will be reviewing two of these in detail, but the first one on this table shows you that we call BRIGHT. It was a study in specifically in autism spectrum disorder uh, children aged uh, three to 17. It was an open label trial and I'll, I'll show you the design and the outcomes in just a moment. But we had 37 patients in that trial and 92% of those uh, children were um, at least moderate to severe ASD based upon the, AS, uh, the ADOS2 uh, instrument and looking at the scoring within the ADOS2, which uh, many of you are familiar with. Uh, FABC was our first open label trial investigation and Fragile X. It was a sm small trial of 20 patients. We did not capture uh, the uh, diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder in those children or the co-diagnosis, but we know from our Connect FX study, which is our large um, uh, randomized double blind placebo control trial in 212 patients that in that trial, which we think would be similar to those in the FABC trial, 85% of the, the children had um, autism spectrum disorder co-diagnosis, and 75% of, of the children in the trial had moderate to severe autism spectrum disorder symptoms. Um, and now um, we just initiated and started a, a follow-on trial to connect FX called ReConnect. Um, and I'll talk about the design of that trial and what's, what is going to be coming in the future and what we're doing with Zenerva. So first, I'd like to talk about the BRIGHT study, and I would not I would be remiss without thanking the investigators who did this trial. This trial was run in Australia by Dr. Honey Husler um, and, and her team there in, in Queensland, Australia, and all the families that obviously participated and contributed um, to this information. The trial was, a, was designed to um, enroll patients with the Aberrant Behavior Checklist community um, score for irritability of at least 18 and a clinical global impression score, severity score of at least four, which is moderate or greater in severity. And so we've heard about many different tools today to measure symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. And the Abbott Behavior Checklist is a, a very common one. It's actually been used uh, and it was used in the previous trials for the approval of the two medicines that are approved uh, by the US FDA. And irritability was also that endpoint used for that. And so um, we wanted to determine what was the outcome if we use this, this tool in our trials as well. Um, the primary objectives to, of this trial was to look at safety and tolerability of Zen002, both in the short term, and we looked at 14 weeks, and then we continued for another 24 weeks. So we've got 38 weeks of, 
of treatment experience, uh, both from a safety perspective and looking at efficacy over time. And the primary efficacy assessments we looked at were, and the primary efficacy assessments we did look at were the ABCC and the CGI improvement, which you've heard again in other presentations today. I'll talk, I'll talk about some other instruments we used um, to look at some of the core symptoms of ASD as well. Um, we used a weight-based dose. So this is a transdermal gel. So if you, if you imagine uh, what that might look like, it, it literally looks like, um, like a, a ketchup, um, little ketchup plastic. You know, if you've, if you've gotten a takeout box with ketchup in it before, it's that uh, you tear the, tear it off and you squeeze it out. That's, that's basically what, how this is packaged and it is weight based dosed. And so uh, children on the lower end of the uh, weight would get 250 milligrams a day and higher weights would get 500 milligrams per day. Um, and again, the last thing I'm, on this slide is thinking about uh, where we were looking to say, did they show significant improvement to continue? Uh, in the longer term piece of the study. And we required at least a 35% improvement in the ABCC irritability scale. Um, this is similar to some of the information you heard earlier where you saw a 25% improvement plus a CGI score improvement. In this trial, um, because uh, being open label, we wanted to raise the hurdle um, a little bit and we went to a 35% improvement in irritability uh, to make sure that we we're carrying forward individuals who demonstrated benefit and could look at the long-term benefit um, of using Zen002 in these patients. A little bit more about the population, as you can see, the mean age, uh, both in those who began, all who began the trial and who continued in the second part of the study was nine, a little over nine years. Uh, similar to every, all the other work, majority of, were boys. And then in terms of, um, race demographics similar to what we see in standard trials. On the right-hand side, you can see just um, the flow of patients um, in terms of the first uh, patients. We did have a, a couple of patients who did withdraw. Some of those were due to just the working within a clinical trial setting and some of the uh, challenges of doing trials in children with um, autism. And then uh, we looked at uh, 28 children who completed that first 14 weeks and 18 of those continued and met that criteria to continue on in the study for long-term. This is a busy slide, but I, I'll uh, set it up for you and you'll see a, a second slide that's similar with a different instrument. This is the Abbott Behavior Community Checklist. Um, and what you see, you see the different um, assessments that are made based upon the types of symptoms that are measured with irritability, inappropriate speech, stereotypy, um, social withdrawal, and hyperactivity. On the left-hand side, you can see the, the population in phase in period one of the trial, and you can see there were generally um, good uh, improvements in all the domains on the ABC, and specifically for irritability, we saw about a not quite a 40% improvement in irritability. And that is similar across the different uh, uh, symptomatologies that the ABC measures. On the right-hand side, uh, we said, what happens in those uh, 18 kids who continued? Uh, did they continue to improve? Did they sustain their improvement? And what you can see here, generally, um, there was slightly a little bit more improvement over time in the ABC, and that was sustained over time. So. Once what was seen at the 14 week mark was pretty much carried forward uh, over time through 38 weeks in those different assessments of symptoms. When we looked at some of the core symptoms using the autism impact measure, um, again, slightly different instrument, but looking more at core symptoms, again, a similar picture looking at the different uh, things that are measured, atypical behavior, communication, peer interaction, uh, receptive behavior and social reciprocity. Again, you can see in general, we saw improvements um, on some of the core symptoms of ASD with the largest improvement um, seen in atypical behavior and uh, re um, receptive behavior, both in the short-term 14-week period and on the right-hand side and those who did continue on 
again, a similar profile, atypical behavior and receptive behavior having the greatest change. But again, you can see in general uh, improvements in some of the core symptoms with the open label study with Zen002. And we, again, this is a, because of the nature of trying to understand what might Zen002 uh, do and how does, how do children respond? We also included other things to look at. Um, and on the left-hand side, we have the parent rated anxiety um, scale for autism. Um, and we know uh, that through our research that uh, part of the challenge is actually looking at anxiousness and how that actually drives other behaviors such as irritability and different findings in kids with autism. And so we wanted to look at uh, these. And unfortunately, there's not great uh, instruments that actually are that can be filled out by the, the child themselves. So these do rely upon caregiver or parent rated scales. And so this is one, uh, actually both of these are parents as well, as was the ABC and the, and the AIM. But this is a anxiety rated scale. And you can see on the left-hand side, um, good reduction and maintain reduction in those children. And this is just in the long-term uh, por portion to make it uh, easier versus showing more graphs. <laughs> and then for the second one is actually a, a parent stress index. Again, reducing the overall stress of the family as well. And looking at CGI, uh, this is actually any improvement. And you see that 90% um, of the children are rated as having, from the clinician perspective, having some improvement. Um, this is, uh, you, you saw some presentations earlier that looked at, um, much or very much improvement, which would be a two, uh, a two or lower score. This is a three or lower score. If you look at the two or lower score, it's about a 70 per, 76% uh, improvement. So again, in an open label nature, um, we found that Zen002 uh, seems to have promise in improving uh, the symptoms and the uh, parent burden in the children with autism spectrum disorder. I'll quickly uh, summarize the, the findings overall, and we, you know, it wouldn't be um, one of the key things to think about is that if you have a drug work, does it, does, is it also well tolerated or not? And so that's a critical piece of any work we do. And we did find that it was generally uh, well tolerated and consistent with other data and other trials. About half of the, the children um, and their families reported that they had an adverse event of any type, whether it's related or unrelated to Zen02. Most of them were mild, 80% uh, were mild. And seven patients um, in the trial were deemed to have treatment-related um, adverse events. And I, I share that in the next bullet point. Um, what type of adverse events are they? Um, if you think about what Zen002 is, and it's, as I said, it's um, a transdermal gel. It, and all of us now have gone through the last two years of COVID. Uh, you're very familiar with uh, all the alcohol gels that we put on our skins. And if you think about Perel, uh, it, it's very much like that. And so um, because of the alcohol content, it can have some drying to the skin. And so we do see some application site reactions such as um, paritis and dryness uh, and things like that. And so that's the most common thing that we see. They tend to be mild and transient in nature. Um, we did have one patient with sleep disorder and increased appetite and one with frequent urination. But again, overall, um, pretty well tolerated um, in the kids that we studied. And we did not find any changes in significant changes in laboratories or EKGs. And especially uh, looking at liver functions, um, that's one thing it's, uh, we have seen um, in non-transdermal forms of CBD. So it's important that we look at that. We did not see any changes in liver function abnormal, uh, laboratories and have not seen that with Zen002. So takeaways, at least from this study with all children with ASD, not with Fragile X. Again, it does provide initial evidence suggesting that um, when administered on top of standard of care, um, it seems to be a benefit in moderate to severe um, ASD. And we did look at all the measures and, and again, uh, in the open label nature, it appears to have, a, have an impact. But because of that, um, obviously further trials are needed in a randomized double blind placebo controlled manner uh, to confirm this data. But again, 
hopefully uh, it, it sets the groundwork um, for understanding how best to use and how to study SAN002 and ASD. I, I wanna transition now to looking at some work in Fragile X. Um, as many of you know, again, Fragile X is the most common monogenic cause of ASD and it's being used and has been used as a model to understand things over time with ASD. Um, the, obviously these children tend to have intellectual, more intellectual disability and may have other uh, comorbidities, but it's a, it's a helpful way to understand what might also be happening in ASD. So I wanna present some data from that and talk about some of our other work. The Connect FX study, which was a double blind study in Fragile X patients. Here you see the, the trial design. It was a 14 week trial to evaluate the efficacy and safety of Zen002. Again, in children, same age group, uh, three to 17 years of age. And you can see using doses of 250 milligrams or 500 milligrams a day versus placebo. And again, in this trial, this was a double blind placebo control trial. And so the children who received placebo got identically matched um, treatment in terms of look, feel, smell, everything like that. And so it was a fully blinded trial uh, to both the caregivers, investigators, and, and, the, and the children. And then they had the opportunity to, to go on into an open label trial uh, that's still ongoing. And I'll share some early data from that trial as well. Um, what we did learn is that in our, in our uh, primary population up front, Zen002 did not statistically separate um, in terms of our primary and key secondary endpoints. Um, but one thing we did do, we, we had scientific evidence that said, um, we know that in a trial that was done by Novartis and, and Fragile X uh, several years ago, there was work looking at what happens if, if the children have um, significant methylation of their FMR1 gene? And so we did a, a pre-planned, um, uh, before we broke the blind analysis of patients that had at least 90% methylation of their FMR1 gene. Um, and these results suggest that um, Zen02 may be beneficial in that group. And I'll walk you through some of that data. Um, we also found a very similar tolerability profile as we did in the, um, the general ASD population study I talked about in the BRIGHT study. And again, application site pain was the, uh, the common um, adverse event when 6.4% of patients and 1% of placebo. So again, um, pretty well tolerated uh, and mild and transient application site uh, pain reaction. So let's talk about the data because I think, you know, we're trying to understand, again, what's going on scientifically uh, within uh, the responsive profile where Zen002 may be uh, beneficial and should be studied. This slide actually looks at, um, in this point, the primary endpoint being the ABCC, um, actually a Fragile X um, scoring of that instrument, looking at social avoidance, uh, which was the primary endpoint in the trial. And so, as I said, um, the left-hand group of bars um, where it says full analysis set on the left are all patients. And so you can see while we saw an improvement, it did not reach significant difference uh, from baseline in terms of the reduction or improvement in symptoms of social avoidance. Uh, when we did the um, pre-specified um, ad hoc analysis, it looking at greater than 90%, we actually did find a difference here. Um, and you can see greater separation and a greater reduction in social avoidance scores. And we also did a, a post hoc looking at 100% methylation. What we think may be going on here is that, um, is specifically in fragile X children, um, you have silencing of that FMR1 gene and um, they are children that are likely most impacted in the function of the endocannabinoid system. Say, so they may be the population that would be uh, more likely to respond to Zen002 or cannabidiol treatment. Um, we will continue to explore this, but again, from a scientific standpoint and looking at what may be happening there, there's, there's plausible explanations, but we will be repeating this work to confirm it. Another important thing that we found um, is not only did we see improvements in social avoidance in those groups that are highly methylated. Um, we also looked and said, is this data meaningful? 
Um, and so we did some psychometric work and we looked at three areas, um, specifically social avoidance, irritability, and socially unresponsive or lethargic based upon the Abbott behavior um, checklist, community checklist. And so what we did is we, um, we did market research with, with families and tried to understand what they felt were important changes and meaningful changes. And then we uh, did this using standard methods uh, that the FDA asked uh, companies to look at to, to define meaningful change. That's what the clinical outcomes and assessment group at FDA uh, really wants uh, companies to do and, and developers of medicines to do, because just having something statistically significant is great, but is it meaningful? And so we were actually able to show that a three-point change in social avoidance was meaningful, a nine-point change in irritability was meaningful, and a five-point change in socially unresponsive lethargic measures were meaningful. And if you look at the data um, and said what percent of patients actually achieved those results, nearly 60% of children with um, significant methylation in our trial did so, uh, and more so statistically than, than placebo. Irritability, again, uh, while it didn't separate in the general group, it did do when you when you looked at that, those who had meaningful change. And there was um, there was a positive trend in socially unresponsive lethargic, but it did not reach significant difference in that case. But again, uh, again, positive and and supportive information to help us have confidence in moving forward in our development. So some lessons learned uh, from our first trial. Again, the, we did see a treatment response that appeared to be greatest in those with higher methylation. We were able to look at psychometric assessments and determine that meaningful change, which I just talked about with you. I didn't show you data, but we also um, looked at a caregiver global impression of severity and change instrument. Um, and we were able to find that that instrument actually performed pretty well as well and have carried that forward in our next trial. And um, based upon our interactions with with the FDA, um, we have looked at the clinical global impression of severity and improvement scale. Um, and based upon their guidance, we are now going forward in our new trial, which I'll talk about reconnect in a moment with a more disease specific um, clinical global impression assessment, um, looking at those specific uh, behaviors and trying to get, again, get the best assessment possible from a clinician standpoint. And so that's, that will be new in our trial. And last but not least, some others have mentioned just some learnings having to do clinical research during the era of COVID and the restrictions. And we've been able to move forward with um, a significant amount of virtual visits in our new trial. Um, in fact, half of the visits in the new trial will be virtual, um, which significantly reduces burden for the families who participate um, and their children. Before I move forward to introduce our new trial, I did want to pause and just um, share some new data with you as well. Um, and as we develop our, our medicines, obviously understanding the safety both in the short term and the long term is critical. Um, here is um, some data we've, we've just uh, found in our long-term open label trial. It's brand new data. Um, and I probably didn't do a great job setting this up earlier, but as I said, um, those who participated in our Blinded trial can actually come into this trial and continue therapy. The patients who were in our FABC original trial, you'll see 10 of those patients rolled in. And also the patients in our future trial, our, our new trial will be able to roll in. But as, as of May 21st, we had uh, 240 children um, in this database and the median length of treatment was 21 months. Um, and so through that period of time, again, we've continued to see a good tolerability profile with no changes in vital signs, ECGs, or laboratories. And on the right-hand side, you can see, um, again, uh, with long-term therapy, um, generally mild to moderate adverse events when they did occur, but you can see here um, that most of them are um, pretty well tolerated with things that you might expect to see in a population of children um, over time. And then in terms of treatment-related adverse events, again, the same thing that we saw in our blinded trial, the most common being application site pain at 6.6% of the children. So again, uh, encouraging information to help us uh, think about and carry forward in our development program in the long term. We also looked at 
what happened over time. And so the patients that were in our double blind uh, Connect FX trial um, could also, again, roll over and continue. And half of those patients, remember, were actually on placebo and half of them were on Zen002. So on the left-hand side of this graph, you see the, the line with the squares and the line with the circle. The line with the square is Zen002 treated patients that were blinded, but they were being treated with Zen002 and they obviously continued on Zen002 in an open label fashion. The line, the bottom line with circles um, actually are the placebo treated patients. And then when they went into the open label trial, what happened? Here, because again, trying to understand what benefit might we be seeing with these children, we put a pretty um, significant hurdle in place to say, um, how many of those children actually had, again, the definition of meaningful change in social avoidance? And so all these children had to have at least a change of three points on their score for social avoidance. And we had an additional criteria that they had to hold that for at least two consecutive visits. And so you can see um, that within the double bond trial, uh, separation from placebo, and then um, again, hopefully you would expect to see that once patients received uh, who were on placebo and then received Zen002, would they improve and would they improve similar to those children already on Zen002? And you can see that they did. So again, a, additional information that encourages us to, uh, to continue forward and advance one of our programs with Zen002. I'll close with um, this slide and one final summary slide, but this is our reconnect trial. Um, We've just implemented this trial. Again, this is in a fragile X population, uh, which we expect again, about 75% uh, or more of the kids will likely have a comorbid diagnosis of ASD. We're looking to enroll about 200 uh, patients and we will be testing that um, hypothesis around the impact of methylation. It'll be important to understand, um, is that replicable? Um, and the FDA has asked us to confirm that in this trial. So we definitely will be doing that. Um, we've also uh, introduced another dose level um, to make sure there's consistency in a milligram per kilogram basis for um, the larger kids that will enroll or more um, heavier weighted children and older children. So we've introduced a 750 milligram dose. And again, uh, this will be an 18 week treatment trial. We've extended the duration as we believe we'll be able to, again, show um, continued benefit of Zen002 with longer therapy. Uh, the endpoint again is social avoidance over time, and we'll look at irritability, we'll look at social interactions, and we'll look at the clinical global impression um, as well for improvement to have that clinician rated score. And again, we are testing the hypothesis around the methylation perspective. Um, again, our prior data shows a pretty strong signal that methylation is important, but frankly, we, we don't want to not treat anybody else, uh, not leave children out who could benefit as well. So again, we are going to retest that hypothesis to determine um, if ch uh, children with um, partial methylation may also continue to benefit or not. And so we'll answer that question in our trial. And in conclusions uh, for our time today, um, again, a hypothesis generating on the impact of methylation. It does appear that these children are the ones who actually have silencing of the gene and that may be important, at least for fragile X. We'll continue to think about um, mechanistic issues for autism in general. Um, we talked about the uh, outcomes in terms of efficacy and safety. And again, um, we are actively enrolling the reconnect trial. And so if you uh, have families or others who have children who also have fragile X as a, as a diagnosis. Um, there is information available. Uh, the trial is on rolling, enrolling now if uh, those children may benefit or would like to uh, participate as families within this trial. So John, um, I'll stop there and would ha be happy to answer any questions depending upon our time in the chat here. Great. Yeah, so I'll just read off a couple of questions that have come through. Um, one, um, was the baseline severity uh, of, of children that were 90% methylated, uh, was, was their baseline severity profile worse 
Um, was that investigated at all? So in the, in the data we have, obviously we didn't do it prospectively, but just looking at the demographics, there were some signals of um, potentially more severe uh, fragile X syndrome. And we looked at uh, both IQ, um, which was a little bit uh, worse in that group. We looked at autism spectrum disorder symptoms. They were more similar, uh, slightly worse. And so we'll continue to look at that in our, in our ongoing study as well. Great question. Okay, uh, a couple more uh, for ZYN002. Um, for the non-responders, did you guys do any sort of uh, genotyping or looking at you know whole exome or anything like that to see if you could find uh, some sort of genetic reason for why there was a non-response? No, we have not yet. Uh, we did, again, looked at the methylation profile and um, I didn't present the data here, but um, again, what we saw was a pretty uh, significant drop off in response for those children that had the less than 90% methylation. Um, what we found was about 80% uh, of our in the children in the uh, Connect study actually were 90 or above percent methylation. And so that in that 20% of kids um, who were less than 90%, um, there was a um, pretty significant drop off in responses in 002. So we, again, going forward, it is an area of investigation and uh, we will be looking to understand that better and to reconfirm that in our reconnect study. Great. And just one last question, just um, when, when you're talking about meaningful change, uh, were you referring to the, the, the minimal clinical important difference or the MCID uh, on the scales? It's a very similar uh, analysis, yes, John. Uh, actually, it's uh, it's FDA has moved to from a patient and a clinic, excuse me, a caregiver rated assessment uh, to meaningful within patient change, mm -hmm. and so it's very similar to the MCID that would be with a with a clinical assessment such as a CGI or something like that, um, and it is done uh, prospectively to define what might be meaningful within the trial, and then you assess it. Um, within your population. And so that's what we uh, have defined in our um, Connect FX, and we'll be repeating that as well in our new study. Did that also include, sorry, just out of curiosity, um, in terms of just clinical uh, meaningfulness, but also did it also interrogate, you know, either uh, a parent or caregiver uh, in terms of uh, their uh, perspective, in terms of whether it was meaningful to them? So in the, in the Connect FX trial, it was done up front in terms of defining what would be meaningful to them. Um, in the new trial, we'll be doing um, post interviews, again, to understand that uh, even more robustly. So great question. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. And uh, we'll move on to the next speaker, uh, Mark Smith. Thank you, John which is a company developing novel microbiome drugs to, to serve patients with serious unmet needs. Mark has led much of the seminal work on engineering the human microbiome, publishing in leading journals such as Nature and New England Journal of Medicine. He translated microbiota transplantation from a topic of research into clinical practice by founding Open Biome, where he, it's, where he pioneered the universal donor model as a safe, effective, and cost-efficient solution for the treatment of Clostridium difficile, uh, uh, the epidemic of Clostridium difficile infection. Open Biome has now treated more than 55,000 patients throughout, through a network of over 1,200 hospitals. And Mark co-founded Finch uh, to develop and scale a new generation of microbiome therapeutics. Mark graduated from Princeton University with a bachelor's in biology and received his PhD in microbiology from MIT. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Smith. Hey, John, thank you so much for, uh, for having me here. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to uh, share some updates on, on our work and uh, a little bit more background on the microbiome and its uh, potential linkages to, to autism. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share our work here today. So uh, I will be making a few forward-looking statements as a publicly traded company. Uh, I need to share a few disclosures. Um, feel free to check out our website where we have a more fulsome uh, set of disclosures available. Uh, so without further ado, I'll, I'll jump into the meat here. Uh, so as a little bit of context on the microbiome, uh, we all have uh, within us in our, in our uh, human genome about uh, 20, 25,000 uh, genes 
There are more than 20 million in our microbiomes. This is the community of tens of trillions of microbes that live on and inside of us. And this enormous genetic repertoire is uh, you know, now increasingly uh, being understood through the application of uh, high throughput sequencing techniques and analytical tools to really understand what this community is doing and, and the roles that it may have in our health. And what we've realized is that this, the microbiome has a really important role in modulating our immune system, our metabolism, and potentially even the, the function of our, our, uh, our, our neurological system. Uh, and so at Finch, our objective is to uh, really leverage some of these exciting tools from genomics and data science uh, to come together to develop a, a, a new class of therapies based on uh, living microbial medicines. Uh, and so just a little bit of context of myself and, uh, and my journey into uh, to this space, uh, I actually started off as a uh, academic researcher studying the human microbiome. Uh, my, my wife's cousin ended up with uh, recurrent C. difficile uh, about a decade ago, and uh, it was a very, very challenging illness for him. He had been sick for about a year and a half. Uh, he had failed 18 rounds of, uh, uh, sorry, per, he had failed seven rounds of vancomycin over that uh, 18 month period. And, you know, for, for me kind of watching his journey, I think there's some, uh, probably analogs to, um, you know, what I understand a lot of, uh, families in, in this community feel where there just really weren't good options available to him. Uh, he ended up, uh, sort of taking matters into his own hands, uh, providing an at-home microbiota transplant and worked for him. But I just felt this is not a sustainable solution. Uh, this is not how we should be, uh, serving patients. Uh, and so I started an organization, as, uh, as John mentioned, called Open Biome uh, to, to serve this community and, and make these kinds of treatments available for patients that had failed, uh, you know, all available therapies for treating recurrent C. difficile. Really proud of the impact that we've been able to have uh, in uh, the, the C. difficile uh, patient population. And uh, a little over half a decade ago, I started Finch. Uh, with the objective of, of really scaling this, uh, this sort of new platform of microbial medicines uh, to other therapeutic areas uh, and to develop uh, a new generation of products that uh, can uh, really aim to, uh, to build uh, effective microbial therapies uh, that can scale and, and really work for patients. And so a little bit about how we do that at Finch, uh, you know, we've You'll see if you if you you know jump on clinicaltrials.gov and actually just you know uh, look up all the ongoing studies in microbiota transplantation. There's really been an explosion in um, in research activity uh, over the last decade, where you know now that you'll see more than 300 ongoing clinical trials exploring microbiota transplantation, a wide range of therapies. And you know our own view is uh, not all of these are going to work, uh, but those that do uh, you know deserve follow up. And we have just an extraordinary opportunity to mine those clinical data to identify you know, what are the specific organisms and, uh, and, and metabolic pathways that are actually driving the effects that we see in patients. And we think this is a really uh, logical approach to, uh, to uh, address this sort of new therapeutic modality where we can really learn from what's, what's happening in the clinic, what's, uh, what patients are experiencing and go through a process of uh, what we call human first discovery. So reverse translation from what we're already seeing uh, in the clinic to, to inform the kinds of therapies that, uh, that we develop to, to, to scale in order to, to serve patients. Uh, and so uh, we've been very successful in, uh, in, in applying this approach to a number of therapeutic areas. So uh, you know, we have a phase three program in recurrent C. difficile, uh, having completed uh, a positive a uh, uh, placebo-controlled randomized uh, phase two study uh, just a, 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 a couple of years ago. Uh, we have a great collaboration with Takeda fo focused on ulcerative colitis and uh, Crohn's disease. And then the, the main focus of our time today, of course, will be uh, on the, the work that we're doing uh, in, in autism uh, with FIN211. And uh, we also have a program uh, focused on chronic hepatitis B infections as well. Uh, and so just a, a little bit about the, the, the tools that we've developed at Finch uh, in order to address diseases that we believe uh, may be linked to the microbiome. We have on one hand, uh, an approach that we call uh, complete consortia. So all of us have living within us, uh, this community of you know, tens of trillions of microbes. And what we're able to do is identify rigorously screened healthy donors and then harvest intact microbial communities 
from these donors, uh, encapsulate them in enteric coated capsules that release at the appropriate location uh, within a patient's gastrointestinal tract, uh, and then establish a, a sort of new living community uh, in these patients. And so on one hand, we have these complete consortia donor-derived products. And then we also have what uh, we call our targeted consortia products. So where we've identified specific bacteria that we believe can have a big impact on patients and then have isolated those, grown those up in pure culture, uh, the way you might uh, ferment beer or something like that, right? So these you know, large anaerobic fermentation chambers. Uh, and then, you know, again, uh, encapsulated those in, in enteric coated capsules that will release in the appropriate location in the GI tract. Uh, and what we're, what we're doing in, uh, in autism with the FIN211 program is actually combining uh, both elements of this platform. So developing what we call an enriched consortia product, uh, which has both a complete consortia scaffold, uh, leveraging a lot of the exciting data that we've seen from microbiota transplantation, while also including uh, an individual strain uh, that, that's not found in all donors uh, that we believe may be really important for, uh, for serving these patients. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the, the FIN211 program as we go, but that's the conceptual framework that we're using for the design and development of this product. And so I, you know, for this community, I don't need to, to share um, how urgent the need is here. There's a really large unmet need. Uh, what I will highlight is you know, our development is specifically focused on the subset of uh, children with autism uh, that also suffer from uh, significant GI symptoms. Uh, and you know, we believe there are about a third of patients uh, with autism uh, that suffer from uh, significant GI symptoms. We're specifically focused on those uh, with significant constipation. And we believe that by, by focusing on this subset of, uh, of patients, uh, you know, we can uh, manage some of the heterogeneity uh, that, that exists within the autism community and find a, a subgroup that we think is uh, maybe more likely to, to respond to this therapy as an initial target for development with opportunities to potentially expand uh, the addressable population over time. And so, you know, a little bit about uh, what's driving our, our interest in this area and our decision to uh, pursue a, a, a novel therapeutic uh, based on the microbiome to, to serve the autism community. So, uh, you know, first, just a, a word on the epidemiology. Uh, you know, we know that there are, you know, certain uh, early childhood uh, events that, that seem to correlate with um, the risk of developing autism later in life. So whether it's C-section birth or duration of breastfeeding or exposure to antibiotics, there are a number of elements that seem to um, be related to the composition of the microbiome uh, that, that are uh, epidemiologically associated with um, the, the risk of developing autism. And the antibiotic state, I think, is particularly interesting because we've seen a dose-dependent effect where um, individuals that have been exposed to uh, more frequent uh, uh, doses of antibiotics during the first two years of life um, are at a significantly higher risk of uh, developing autism later in life. So this kind of epidemiological framework uh, uh, is, a, is one clue to us that uh, it, the, the microbiome may be uh, one important element of the uh, pathophysiology of, of autism. We've also spent a lot of time trying to understand uh, why this might be the case. Uh, and you know, one mechanism that, that we find interesting is the, the role of, uh, of oxytocin signaling uh, in, in autism. You know, uh, there's been a lot of work uh, focused on delivering exogenous uh, oxytocin, uh, given the um, important roles that oxytocin plays in, uh, in modulating sociality and bonding. Uh, what's, what's particularly interesting to us about, the, about oxytocin is you know, it may be possible to induce endogenous production, so the production uh, within an individual uh, by, uh, by modulating the microbiome. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, another uh, mechanism that we believe could be very important and could uh, uh, be relevant both for the, uh, some of the behavioral as well as uh, gastrointestinal symptoms that uh, children with, with autism experience is the, the role of uh, the gut barrier uh, function uh, in the uh, etiology of autism. So we know that uh, children with, with autism uh, tend to have uh, a less robust uh, gut barrier. So they have sort of a, a leaky gut, which leads to the translocation of uh, certain uh, neuroactive microbial metabolites, like uh, 4-EPS is, is, is one uh, reasonably well-known example of these. 
And uh, we know that uh, microbial interventions uh, can help to restore the integrity of the, the gut barrier. And, and this could be one way uh, that we both improve some of the um, gastrointestinal symptoms and also avoid the, um, the circulation of some of these uh, neuroactive microbial metabolites and also potentially influence uh, the uh, neuroinflammation, which we believe could also be uh, an important driver of, um, of, of some of the, uh, the symptoms that are experienced by, by children with autism. And so I wouldn't, of course, be, be talking about any of this if it weren't for the, the clinical data uh, that, that supports this. Again, our whole model uh, for developing new therapies here at Finch uh, is to, to really learn from what we're seeing in, in patients and in the clinic. And, uh, you know, in this case, uh, we're really excited that we've seen data from more than 200 patients uh, that have been uh, treated with microbiota transplantation uh, across a range of studies. And each one of these studies has, has their own limitations that I think are, are important to, uh, to highlight. And, and we'll discuss some of those as we, as we dig into the data a little bit more. Uh, but uh, taken as a whole, uh, we find that this is uh, you know, really exciting uh, you know, proof of principle data uh, that guides our development and really informs our uh, our understanding that the, the microbiome uh, may play an important role in, in the development of, uh, of some of the symptoms of autism. And what we've seen is, you know, across these studies, we've seen improvements in both uh, GI and behavioral endpoints, uh, you know, again, across a number of different uh, investigational sites, uh, different centers, um, really all around the world. And, you know, there's a, a recent cell paper uh, around the role of the, the microbiome and, uh, and autism uh, that, that highlighted, I think, the importance of this interventional data. Uh, the, the study was uh, evaluating uh, the correlations between the microbiome and autism and found that it may actually be driven by uh, an underlying correlation with, uh, with diet in, in, in children with autism. And this is exactly why we've been so focused on interventional data. So looking at uh, you know, what happens when you sort of uh, change the composition of, a, of an individual's microbiome and the impact that has on their, um, on their, their, their symptoms and, and clinical outcomes. Uh, and this is why uh, you know, we believe that this uh, reverse translation approach that, that we're using at Finch is such an important uh, 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 tool for, uh, for really unpacking the role of the, the microbiome in this, uh, in this population and, and others as well. Uh, so now we'll dig into the data together. So um, I will, uh, I'll begin by uh, walking through uh, you know, one of the, the first studies that, that came out in this space um, uh, run by uh, Jim Adams uh, at uh, Arizona State University. Uh, and uh, this was published in a, in a series of papers uh, starting in 2017. And uh, in this study, it was a small open label study with the, the caveats that come with um, that methodology that um, you know, conducted a, center, a single uh, investigational center. Um, and, and what they did is they um, you know, provided uh, a, a really robust um, series of uh, microbiota transplantations over a period of uh, uh, an eight week sort of induction uh, process. And they uh, evaluated these, uh, these children both at, at baseline eight weeks after the cessation of therapy, and then even two years after um, these patients uh, were, were last treated uh, with a microbiota transplantation. And what they found was really encouraging. So uh, in that uh, eight week time point, uh, you know, they already saw uh, you know, statistically significant improvements in GI symptoms, uh, those are preserved even two years off therapy. Uh, but the behavioral endpoints, I think, are, are, are the, the data that we found most encouraging. So, um, you know, again, a statistically significant improvement at the eight week time point. Um, and, you know, at two years uh, after, uh, after treatment, a number of kids, um, you know, sort of uh, fell below what a threshold that has um, historically been used for, for identifying uh, uh, autism. Uh, and, and, you know, we found that these were uh, really encouraging. Nonetheless, we, we've, uh, you know, also said, well, this is a, an open label study. And, and I think there's some important caveats with that. And so, you know, another data set that, that we've looked at uh, to really inform our perspective on the, the potential role of microbial therapies in, in the treatment of autism uh, is a study that, uh, that used a comparator arm. So in this study, uh, patients uh, either receive just behavioral therapy alone or behavioral therapy plus microbiota transplantation. Uh, and, uh, and what we saw in this study uh, is that uh, you know, these, these uh, children again experienced uh, significant improvements in GI symptoms and behavioral symptoms. And those were associated with 
uh, changes in the microbiome with increases in microbial diversity. Uh, and you know what's particularly interesting about, about this study and, and the next that I'll, I'll highlight is uh, in these studies, they found uh, without the same like really intensive induction therapy that was used in the Jim Adams study, they found that uh, you know, the effects seemed to, to wane with time. So um, you know, there was an initial improvement and then uh, over time, uh, you know, the, the, some of the, uh, in, the benefits seem to, to wane. Uh, and this may inform you know, the, the need for long-term maintenance therapy uh, in order to, to maintain the, the benefits that are initially observed. And I think that's a really important question that we, we look forward to digging into in, in further detail. Uh, and the, the third study that I'll, I'll, I'll briefly highlight here, um, in part because it's just come out uh, quite recently, just a few weeks ago, um, really builds on, on some of the other studies that I mentioned. In this study, they uh, children received either uh, colonoscopically administered material or uh, an oral therapy. And we thought this was an important uh, to, uh, to evaluate the um, you know, potential role of, uh, of treatment modality. Uh, and when we found that there were you know, no differences between those, um, those two modes of delivery, which uh, is really encouraging for us because uh, we believe that a you know, colonoscopic intervention would be really challenging for, uh, for children, but uh, you know, an oral therapy obviously has a, a lot of uh, benefits in terms of access. Uh, and so uh, you know, these, uh, in this study, uh, patients received uh, a weekly dose of therapy for a four-week induction period, uh, and then were evaluated uh, at four and eight weeks uh, after therapy. And so uh, you can see that the um, GI uh, uh, symptoms improved uh, quite significantly. And here uh, we're showing uh, you know, uh, the, the data around the, the Bristol stool scale, uh, which is, is nice because it's a, a, a somewhat objective measure looking at the physical characteristics of school samples that these children are passing. Uh, and you know, at the end of therapy and, and even eight weeks off therapy, um, there's some uh, really uh, significant improvements uh, here in terms of the, the, the fraction of um, bowel movements that were, uh, were, were abnormal according to the Bristol stool scale. Uh, uh, also really encouraged by uh, the behavioral outcomes and, and here we're, we're using the CAR scores as, as in uh, the, the earlier studies that I mentioned. Uh, and you can see the, the sort of temporal effects here where there was a, a, a significant improvement at, at actually all of the time points, uh, but that was most acute uh, at the, the first time point. And there was, um, uh, you know, perhaps some uh, directional uh, uh, reversion that occurred uh, in some of the, the later time points here. Uh, so, you know, natural question again, you know, getting back to the, some of the mechanistic um uh, uh, concepts that I introduced earlier is, you know, how does this work? And, you know, I think there are a lot, a number of important caveats uh, that are that are worth highlighting anytime we we speak about, uh, you know, developing animal models of, of such a complex phenotype uh, like, like autism. Uh, nonetheless, I think these can be important tools to really try to understand mechanism because uh, of the uh, limitations of the, the kinds of work that we can do uh, in clinical studies. And so uh, in this uh, animal model uh, where the, some of the, the key endpoints that were evaluated were the, the amount of time that these animals spent uh, interacting uh, with pairwise interactions with other mice, uh, we found that uh, interestingly, there's an individual strain that, that we knew is associated with uh, induction of endogenous oxytocin uh, that when it was added, uh, so you know the the black here are um, uh, neurotypical uh, models, the the red are the the autism model, and then blue are is the autism model treated with the this oxytocin inducing strain. And you can see that uh, you know uh, in this case we were able to uh, restore neurotypical levels of uh, 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 these pairwise interactions uh, by delivering this oxytocin inducing strain. Uh, uh, what's interesting is that was uh, uh, correlated with an improvement in uh, in restoration of uh, uh, neurotypical oxytocin levels. Um, so, you know, by itself, I think this would be uh, it'd be uh, difficult to draw any strong inferences from it. What's what's particularly helpful here is actually seeing uh, some of the, um, the the knockout work that that was done as a follow up to this. So, if you vagotomize these mice and sever the vagal nerve, which connects the uh, the gastrointestinal tract to the central nervous system, uh, you eliminate that rescue effect of uh, adding in this um, uh, oxytocin inducing strain. So you can see that the, uh, the interaction times uh, are, are significantly lower among those mice that were, uh, were treated 
with this oxytocin inducing strain that, that had a, um, a, a severed vagal nerve. Uh, and and, and it, it sort of uh, complementing that data, um, I found that if you knock out the oxytocin receptor, uh, the gene that uh, is responsible for uh, the, the, the protein that binds oxytocin receptor, uh, oxytocin, uh, you can see that that also eliminates the, the rescue effect of adding in this oxytocin inducing strain. Uh, and so uh, collectively, one of the uh, inferences that we've drawn from these data is that uh, oxytocin may be an important uh, driver of um, uh, in this model system, and that uh, you know there are individual bacteria that that we could uh, deliver uh, that are capable of restoring uh, uh, neurotypical behavior, and that was associated with increases in, in oxytocin, and it appears to be. Uh, uh, induced through uh, a you know stimulation of the oxytocin receptor through a signal that is being transduced via the vagal nerve. So um, you know these are all uh, uh, you know we believe uh, important uh, early signals that that may suggest a, a role for these oxytocin inducing strains as part of a, a broader microbial therapy that that could be used to try to replicate and build on some of the results that we've seen with uh, whole community microbiota transplantation. And so uh, this has heavily informed our product strategy here at Finch. We've chosen to uh, deliver what we call uh, an enriched consortia product, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, that's the design of Fin211. And the idea is we have this complete consortia, which aims to, to really deliver an entire community, replicating some of the exciting data that we've seen with microbiota transplantation and this individual oxytocin-inducing strain and sort of um, the ability to deliver both elements of that. And we've, uh, we've had some really encouraging engagements with the FDA. Uh, in our pre-IND meeting, uh, they agreed with us that we can go directly into children with autism. Uh, and in the ASPIRE trial that's gonna be starting uh, in the first half of next year, uh, we're gonna be able to do just that. We're gonna be able to um, jump right in to start serving uh, uh, children with autism. And they also agreed with us that demonstrating benefit for either GI or behavioral symptoms could be sufficient to support a BLA. And we think that that uh, opens up a number of, uh, of interesting development strategies for us in terms of how we may be able to advance this therapy uh, to be available and accessible to patients in the future. Uh, so uh, I mean, I'm very excited to uh, introduce the, the ASPIRE trial here today. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a phase 1B study that's uh, designed to uh, really help us understand the optimal uh, dosing level and dosing regimen that we can use as we carry this product forward into later stages of development. And so uh, the, the part A, the first component of this study uh, is gonna be a dose escalation study. So patients will either receive a low or a higher dose of FIN211 for a two week period. Uh, and then we'll take the, the highest tolerated dose um, from the first phase of this study uh, into a small randomized study where patients will get randomized to either receive uh, antibiotic pretreatment with the idea that by, uh, you know, similar to stem cell therapy, where you sort of want to uh, knock out the incumbent community in order to create a blank canvas on which you can sort of uh, paint this, this new ecosystem, uh, you know, using antibiotics as a tool to standardize the baseline microbiome of uh, of uh, children that are that are receiving this therapy, or uh, patients with that that don't receive um, uh, antibiotic pretreatment, uh, and our preference, if we can uh, avoid the need for antibiotics, would be to to move forward with a simpler therapy. We want to rigorously test that question uh, in this uh, in this first uh, set of studies that we have the right both dosing level and regimen, understanding whether we need antibiotics before we move into a larger uh, placebo controlled study. And the primary objectives uh, will be looking at safety and tolerability, uh, as well as the um, pharmacokinetics, so how these organisms are engrafting in patients. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll also be measuring as exploratory endpoints, uh, some of the key behavioral and, and GI endpoints that we discussed earlier. Uh, and so, you know, really excited about uh, the opportunity to um, begin uh, evaluating these, these novel therapies uh, in patients uh, next year and to start to get some early, uh, early readouts from these trials uh, in order to understand whether we're on the right track and uh, we're going to be able to continue to advance these therapies. So uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, come here again this year and uh, share some updates on where we are. Uh, I hope that uh, next year uh, when, uh, when we present again, we'll have some early data from these studies 
and um, really thankful to uh, everyone in the, the community that's come together to, to help inform the design of this study. And, uh, and, and I hope to uh, continue to be, to be able to uh, work with the community to uh, evaluate and, and understand and, and ultimately develop uh, some, some really exciting novel therapies here. So um, thanks and i um, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Mark. Uh, there's a few questions that have come in. So um, one, uh, is the oxytocin producing strain uh, named in the paper that you were citing? Uh, yes, it is. It's uh, uh, in the, the, the paper that's, uh, that's cited there, they use uh, lactobacillus strain. Great, was that ruteri? Uh, yes, they used, uh, they used an L. ruteri strain in, in that study. Great. Uh, was there also, was that the same paper that showed a connection with uh, BH4 metabolism as well? It's uh, the, the paper that I cited is a different paper, but by the same group. Okay. Um, one question for you in, in your trial. I know it's early days and maybe not, maybe not a part of this study, um, but are you guys, are you thinking about also doing any type of neuroimaging or anything of that sort to try and look at the actual, you know, fMRI or some other, other sort of uh, uh, brain-based changes uh, as a result of FMT treatment? Yeah, uh, it's a, a topic that we spent a lot of time discussing with the team and, you know, kind of weighing some of the pros and cons. You know, we want to uh, minimize the burden on, you know, uh, kids and their families, but we're also really interested in, in that data. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I, I don't know that we've made a, a final decision on whether we're going to, uh, to include those in, in, at some point uh, in the study, potentially as a sub-study. Um, but uh, I, the expectation is that that won't be a requirement uh, for the study um, at, at this point, but it's a, a topic that we're continuing to discuss. Cool. Uh, one thing that might be interesting, uh, if, if the you know, microbiome, oxytocin, BH4 side of the story you know, pans out in humans, uh, Richard would be a good person to talk to. One of the, one of the studies that we published, Arkansas Children's, was actually on tetrahydrobiopterin or BH4 treatment, uh, CUVAN for, for autism, we showed that there appeared to be a connection with uh, nitric oxide metabolism. And we theorized that maybe it had something to do with uh, improving cerebral blood flow. Uh, mm -hmm. So be curious if, you know, if FMT treatment may actually have effects on uh, nitric oxide metabolism, and if that actually could be shown up if you do decide to do any fMRI type studies and see changes in cerebral blood flow patterns it might be neat. Um, so a couple other questions have come through. Um, uh, if the study shows that vancomycin pretreatment is important for effectiveness, uh, is it possible to extend the same to placebo group as well, since they may be left out of the uh, FMT uh, treatment protocol? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So in this study, uh, uh, Aspire Part B, there won't be a placebo group. So actually, everybody's gonna, um, uh, you know, have access to therapy. Uh, the group that's uh, only receiving Tin211 won't won't get the the vancomycin uh, therapy uh, as part of it because you know there could be efficacy just from the vancomycin component, which is um, you know one of the questions that we wanna um, we wanna understand as as part of the study. Uh, so, uh, but but there there won't be a um, uh, vancomycin uh, standalone arm in this study. Okay. Uh, another question that's come through, and I think this will be the last question before, before we move on to the next uh, presenters. Um, but um, do you have uh, a theory or uh, any rationale for why uh, there might be a need for multiple FMTs for children with ASD? Uh, fall into that question, uh, maybe an underlying mechanism affecting the microbiome that requires certain bacteria to be constantly replenished. Uh, have you thought about that? And um, do, you, do you have any suggestions there? Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a great and actually very complex series of, of questions around this sort of uh, ecological dynamics and, um, and sort of longevity of these communities. The, the short answer is, you know, uh, children with autism, they, they have a, you know, if, if there are sort of disruptions, their microbiome, it may be driven by, you know, dietary preferences or other, uh, you know, sort of, uh, elements that, that, that they experience. And so, so 
uh, some, whether it's, you know, genetics or their environment or diet, something has uh, about that those, that those confluence of factors have selected for a dysbiotic microbiome. And so, you know, part of our thinking is that uh, without constantly sort of replenishing this, um, uh, the, some of those missing microbes, you know, they may be lost over time as, as they have been uh, potentially by some of those factors. And so that could be one reason. And it's, it's something we're really excited to be able to study uh, here is we'll be able to actually measure how the community changes over time and actually use the sort of community decay in part as, um, you know, to inform our understanding of how long dosing may be necessary for in the future. So um, that's how we think about engraftment and pharmacokinetics uh, in this context. And it's a really important and, and complex part of how we think about uh, developing these kinds of therapies in autism and, and in a range of other uh, applications as well. Great. Then one last quick question, whether it be related, you know, just in general, um, it could be related to autism or just, you know, in just in general, in terms of uh, FMT treatment. Um, curious, uh, do you know of any reports on really any condition of uh, doing a microbiome transplant therapy and that affecting dietary preferences uh, after the fact? Uh, I don't know of any uh, rigorous studies of the question, uh, though anecdotally, I've, I've heard of some pretty significant changes in dietary preferences among C. diff patients, though those are kind of to be expected because they're, you know, have very, very severe diarrhea and are, you know, uh, often experience significant weight loss and then, um, you know, uh, have their appetites restored once the uh, probably the underlying driver of that is um, resolution of their um, C. diff and, and the underlying diarrhea. Um, but in a kind of more normal population, I haven't, uh, haven't, uh, haven't heard examples of that yet. Great. All right, Mark. Well, it was always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. And there might be some more questions. Uh, if you wouldn't mind looking at the Q and A and the chat function and get back to folks, uh, I'd be greatly appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll do that, uh, off, off, offline right now and let you guys, uh, continue the exciting, uh, program. Thanks, Mark. Okay, uh, for the treatment of core symptoms of autism. Uh, Dr. Margerian, or um, I guess Peter Griffin for, the, for, the, for this presentation, uh, <laughs> um, has over 20 years des uh, designing and executing clinical trials uh, for uh, multiple uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, Dr. Margerian uh, has an MD and a PhD uh, from uh, Northwestern uh, University, uh, but he also did fellowships at Boston Children's Hospital uh, with Mass General and Harvard. Uh, uh, Chuck Bramlage is the CEO of, of um, Yamo Pharmaceuticals and is an experienced um, uh, drug developer uh, and has uh, uh, you know, over 28 products uh, that have been launched in 15 therapeutic areas to his name. Uh, it is a privilege to uh, introduce both of these gentlemen, and I will leave it to you guys to uh, dive in. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll start and just give a couple of slide introduction to Yamo. I joined in 2017, very interested, uh, a, a senior scientist at AstraZeneca told me about this compound, L179. And he knows I like startup companies and asked me to talk to the uh, inventor and the investors that had uh, done one previous trial and were in the middle of a second trial. We completed that. Uh, Dr. Tom McGarrian, our chief medical officer, joined us at the end of 17. And we, of course, along with COVID and many other clinical operations people, uh, were not able to do anything the last two years. We also had an issue with raising money. We're very excited to present the current uh, data within the company, as well as what we plan to do right now as we start our third trial. We're very excited about it. Uh, we're interested in your feedback at the end of this. And of course, our expert Tom will walk you through the science behind it. Um, we are seeking an additional million dollars right now of investment. And that investment would uh, cover some more patients above and beyond the 50 that we're going for now to get 40 at the end. We, we think we can do another 20 to 25 patients with another million dollars. So those are the three uh, things I wanted to leave you with at the beginning. Uh, the first slide here, 
We are a clinical stage company uh, that's developing L179 to treat the core symptoms of ASD. Uh, we hold IP that goes to 2033 and other indications. We think there, this drug may work in post-traumatic stress disorder, type 2 diabetes and fibromyalgia. Um, it is a racemic mixture of alpha methyl tyrosine, uh, which decreases catecholamine synthesis. Um, in 2018, we had a fast track designation from the FDA based on our previous two trials. Uh, we didn't have enough data to get the, the next designation, but we feel this current trial that we're uh, starting right now is gonna give us a lot more quality data from five uh, top centers in the country with five experts in autism along with Tom. We're very excited to see what the results will provide. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I'm just hitting some of the highlights here. Um, this month, we're starting this 50 patient double blind uh, study. We're targeting 40 completers in this. Uh, we're having a chronic dosing of 12 week with placebo and or a, a two period crossover with drug. Uh, these patients are 12 to 21 years of age with IQ of at least 70 and moderate impairments in socialization. These patients will be ram randomized between uh, active, the 200 milligram BID and 300 and placebo. We expect to get this information, the data completed by 2023 at the beginning of the year. Uh, we had just recently announced that Autism Impact Fund has become our first institutional investor. We've had all the rest of the investors have been high net worth individuals who have contributed and have an interest in doing something for these patients and their families. Uh, so we are seeking again, another $2 million to cover some upside. It, 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 1 million will cover an additional 20 patients. And that's what we're working on now. Next slide. Okay, so here I, I would like uh, Tom to describe the science behind L179, give you a summary of the first two trials very quickly and more or less go quickly into the current trial that we're starting right now in five centers around the country. So Tom. Thanks Chuck. Can you guys you hear me okay? My volume coming through, Chuck? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, thanks guys. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about our, uh, our exciting um, compound and what we think uh, uh, has some very good promise based on some preliminary data and uh, open label study in a phase uh, 2A study. So um, uh, alpha methylparatyrosine is a competitive inhibitor of tyrosine hydroxylase. And what it um, uh, does is to decrease the presynaptic release um, and stores of um, basically all the catecholaminergic neurotransmitters, um, which of course, as we know, are involved in many different functions, um, some of which, many of which overlap with um, some of the deficits seen in autism, memory reward, attention focus, communication, uh, pain, self mutilation repetitive behaviors. There's also a lot of indirect effects that the catecholaminergic system has, including co-release of, gro of uh, growth factors, modulation of serotonin, acetylcholinergic, vasopressin, oxytocin, and other um, neurotransmitters. Um, and we believe um, that this, is a, this uh, is a mechanism that works centrally as well as peripherally and might address some of the other um, um, medical and problematic uh, concerns that are seen in autism, such as chronic constipation, sleep problems, uh, abdominal distress. Next slide. This is just a kind of a, a mechanistic cartoon of where tyrosine, where, where alpha methylparate paratyrosine hits. As you can see here in the, uh, in the drawing, it really hits at the early stages of conversion of tyrosine to dopa, which there then goes on to impact the production of dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. Tyrosine hydroxylase, as you recall, is the rate limiting step. It's a, it's a, um, uh, is part of the feedback loop in terms of controlling um, the uh, production of catecholamines. The reason that I think uh, the inventor thought about using this compound was because of the, the fact that catecholamines are known to play um, a role, one of the role of many neurotransmitters in regulating the dysregulated functions in ASD. 
In particular, many of us in the field know that dopamine receptor blockers, beta blockers, alpha-2 agonists do have some impact on improving some of the behaviors noted in autism. Sometimes those improvements do lead to improvements in socialization, but it's very variable. And we also know that we're not hitting the entire catecholaminergic, we're not modulating the whole catecholaminergic system when we use these drugs, we're, at, we're kind of hitting various components. So the thought here is, is maybe just, a, maybe rather than hitting specific receptors, which are associated to with side effects, just down-regulating the overall tone of the catecholaminergic system might be a benefit. And that was the basis for um, this kind of broad spectrum approach. Next slide. So an open label study was done with eight children. This is published um, data, open label, all the caveats and, and disadvantages of open label being oh, obvious. Oh. Sorry. Uh, the, the caveats of open label uh, limitations being, uh, being obvious and mentioned earlier by our previous speaker. Nonetheless, uh, we saw really a, a, a strong uh, a substantive majority, anywhere between um, um, six to eight of the six to seven of the eight patients who showed improvement in multiple assessment measures. Uh, in the ADOS, for instance, we, show, we saw anywhere from uh, uh, essentially um, five of, uh, of the eight patients showed uh, a significant drop in their scores, some dropping to below the cutoff for autism on the ADOS. The clinical global impression uh, assessment of um, severity also dropped by uh, usually about uh, two points, occasionally one point. And then the Connors parent rating skills also showed nice trends in the positive direction for multiple domains within the Connors forms. Next uh, slide. So with this, the, the, the original team before we joined decided to do a um, 40 uh, patient safety and dosing range study uh, looking at 100 milligrams three times a day versus 200 milligrams three times a day uh, in a double blinded randomized fashion. Um, essentially what they showed was the drug was safe and well tolerated, which was the primary outcome measure, and, and a better response seen at the total daily dose of 600 milligrams or 200 milligrams TID compared to 100 milligrams TID. None of the efficacy measures were powered for statistical significance. And, and to be honest, only 10 patients received active treatment in each of the arms, so extremely small numbers. We, we were not again looking for a statistically significant, but just um, kind of uh, quantitative trends in the right direction. And in fact, we did see uh, multiple measures, including uh, the violent adaptive behavior scales in the socialization domain, the ADOS2, the CGI, the repetitive behavior scales, and the SRS showed um, uh, greater trends in the treated over the non-treated uh, for uh, benefit uh, uh, in the patients treated for only 28 days. So this was a 28-day study, um, thereby uh, demonstrating um, uh, non-statistical but nonetheless clinically significant differences. Um, based on this information, the FDA granted us fast track, as Chuck mentioned. Next slide. This is the overall um, flow diagram of the study. You can see this was because it was a safety study, and there was not not a lot of uh, pre, there was no preclinical data available. But because the L enantiomer of this drug had been um, approved previously, the FDA al allowed us to go in with the racemic mixture uh, as long as we did five patients open label in each of the dosing cohorts first, um, check for EKGs and labs, make sure there were no adverse events, and then allowed us to randomize 15 patients um, initially in the 300 milligram daily dose, 100 milligrams TID, and then in the 200 milligrams TID, 600 milligram total daily dose. And so we randomized after the safety um, cohort was completed, 15 patients, um, two to one active to placebo, uh, first in the 100 milligram cohort, and then in the 200 milligram cohort in the active um, group in the um, second cohort, the 200 milligram TID cohort, we had one child withdraw due to um, a single seizure that was um, not an SAE because it was just an out, uh, out of hospital seizure. Uh, and then um, um, a few people, two people, um, one person withdrew in the placebo group and the high dose group just because they had a parent, um, a parent decided not to continue with the study. 
Next slide. And so what we saw here was on the left hand panel, this was a change in uh, clinical global of impression in the two groups. The placebo group showed a 0.3 uh, point uh, change, categorical change, um, and the absolute change in the um, treated group was almost a full point, 0.8, so about a, a 0.5 point difference. In the um, lower dose, we saw um, a lower change, a half a point in the treated group versus 0.2, but again, a dose response, a higher degree of change in the um, CGI severity in the high dose compared to the low dose. Similarly, in the ADOS, there was a mean full point change in the treated group um, compared to really no change in the placebo group at the high dose. And in the bottom right quarter panel, you can see a half a point change in the low dose compared to, again, no change in the placebo. Not statistically significant because of the small numbers and, and variability, but still an interesting dose response change that was uh, observed. And again, some of these changes were, these changes actually were seen across multiple measures as you see in the next slide. We saw similar changes in the um, violent adaptive behavior scales in the socialization domain. You can see um, a six point improvement, uh, go back up, six point improvement uh, in the violent uh, socialization uh, for the first four weeks with then a return to baseline, a gradual return to baseline over four weeks uh, over this ensuing four week period. And you see really virtually very minimal change in the placebo group. Uh, we also noted, uh, did a kind of a responder analysis and you can see that some of the response was driven in the high dose group by quite large changes um, in, the, um, in those who were treated anywhere from 20 to 29 points uh, amongst um, two out of the seven patients that had a record. Um, and then uh, about three point changes um, in another um, individual, three points being kind of the minimum important clinical difference that we'd like to see with the Vineland. Next slide. On the SRS, we saw um, significant categorical drops um, from mild, uh, uh, in some cases from severe to moderate, from moderate to mild, and from, mild, from moderate and severe to normal um, in those who were treated with the high dose and the low dose, we really didn't see this level of change, but in the high dose, you can see on the motivation score, a 10 point drop um, compared to about four points on the placebo, less difference, but still higher trends of dropping on the, the social communication T-score and the communication interaction T-score. Next slide. When we looked at the ABCs and the SRSs for particular areas where we saw uh, responders being higher versus um, in the active group versus the placebo groups. You can see on the social withdrawal lethargy and on the inappropriate street uh, uh, speech, we had um, patients responding on the active group about 40% and 50% respectively versus only zero or 25% on the placebo patients. On the SRS awareness and social motivation, um, about 50% of the patients responded positively with a two or more point improvement. Um, uh, in social awareness, 60% for social uh, motivation versus 20% um, and 0% respectively for the placebo patient. So when we did uh, some sub-analyses, we saw much larger patients, uh, much larger rates, 50, between 40 and 60% response rates. Next uh, slide. So we're uh, actually just um, announced the, um, or in the uh, beginning phases of uh, um, initiating this study, which is a um, phase two B crossover trial. Um, we're starting off with 50 patients to um, randomize 40 or to complete 40, I should say, 50 patients randomized to complete 40. This will be um, total daily dosing of um, 400 to 600 milligrams. And it'll be BID dosing instead of TID dosing. And that's because we did some PK work in the interim between the last study and this study. And we're able to show a um, marked and prolonged half-life compared to the L enantiomer. So the L enantiomer of uh, uh, alpha methylparatyrosine has a half-life of about three hours. When you use a racemic mixture, you extend that half-life to about 12 hours, making it um, doable to dose twice a day. And so this will be an ABBA um, study where half the patients will receive drug first and then wash out and go to cross over to placebo. And the other half will receive placebo first, wash out, and then go to 
um, treatment. And that treated group will be split between 200 milligrams BID and 300 milligrams BID 50-50. We're also um, stratifying kind of a soft stratification around anxiety because we do believe anxiety levels might be a modulator of responses. Um, and our, our primary uh, endpoint is the Vineland socialization uh, domain, looking at actually the growth, uh, growth scale values as the primary measure and then the um, standard scores. We'll also be looking at some key secondary measures, including the BOSC, uh, the CGI um, weighted for socialization, um, and then also the PGI, which is a parent um, caregiver uh, endpoint that where the parents will choose the top three um, symptoms of concern and then rate those um, on the um, same seven point Likert scale as the CGI. We'll also be using the social responsiveness scale, uh, social responsiveness scales in the various domains within, um, and then the um, uh, PRAS, the parent rated anxiety scale, um, and um, looking at the uh, parent behavior checklist subdomains, as well as the caregiver stream and um, some of the um, uh, other domains, all the other domains actually within the violence so of the communication domain and the daily living um, activities of daily living domains. Next slide. So this is just a kind of a listing of the outcome measures that we're using. I think these are pretty well known by most of the folks in this, in this group, but um, uh, key secondary measures being the BOSC. We're excited to um, be able to use the BOSC because it's, it's starting to be uh, an interesting um, endpoint to be used that gives some of that structured uh, play activity um, scoring based off of some of the um, ADOS modules um, and methodologies that gives um, a sense of uh, outcome that is um, measured with a third party involvement uh, utilizing third party scoring. And we're excited about that because again, many of us have used the ADOS um, uh, to see, look for changes, but of course it's not a tool that is very sensitive or meant to be look, used for long-term outcomes and longitudinal changes, whereas the BOSC is. So uh, we're very, uh, very excited to be using that. And then also um, switching to a GSV, growth scale value responder analysis versus um, standard scores. Many people know um, standard scores can still decline in a child with autism, but it's really that rate of decline and whether or not you can stabilize uh, and have new skills learned on the, uh, on the violin that is important. So even if a child, for instance, is flat on a socialization um, T-score, uh, but grows or um, expands their abilities more than the typical child with autism, that is um, something to be uh, really, I think, taken as a positive outcome and should be looked at. So the GSV allows us to do that. Um, next slide, Eugene. So we have five sites uh, that have been um, chosen and, um, and qualified and uh, are in various stages of starting. We have the Thompson Center in Missouri, the Thompson Center in Southern California, um, which I am actually a part of. Um, the PI there is uh, Dr. Gola. We have the Center for Autism, SARC in um, um, Southwest um, Autism Research Center, I mean, the Center for Autism in, um, at Rush in Chicago, and then the Wheel and Columbia um, CADB Center in New York with, uh, with uh, Jeremy Beester uh, Vanderwall. So very excited to be running this. And uh, we have two, uh, two of the sites, three of the sites initiated already and waiting for the first patient enrolled, hopefully by this month. And I'll turn it over to, um, to Jeff. Yeah, so uh, the long-term plan for L179 is, as we mentioned, to get the results of the data in early 2023. We would expect a three-month, three-year development program before we would get uh, approval for the drug sometime in 2026, early 27. So that's our current target that we have. We, of course, will go to the FDA, and we're hoping the fast track designation can help speed up the process. We obviously will do a compassionate use program after this with good results uh, for those patients that were in the trial. We will also uh, look to do other uh, work that the FDA has asked us to do, which uh, we can get into at another point. The last slide just is the point.
points out, <clears throat> Eugene, if you could hit the last slide there, uh, the team that's uh, been put together the last five years really uh, to do this work that we have right now. You've met Tom, uh, Tracy, Dr. Tracy Fisher came to us with lots of experience in clinical development and regulatory affairs. She's leading the reg function for us. And Wynn, Wynn is the senior director of our operations and is running our trial, has a wealth of background. Tom used to work with her in previous uh, roles. And uh, Eugene is on the line now, our CFO. So we've got a small team. We would expect with positive results, we would grow the team another 25, 30 employees uh, to help ramp up for the uh, phase three. So in, in, in essence, that's what we have. Uh, we'd like to turn it over for questions you, you may have that uh, Tom or I can answer. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Um, looks like Tom's addressing one of the questions that's come through uh, via the chat, so thank you. Um, one question I have, um, have you guys looked to see, given the, the dopamine theory of uh, ADHD um, and what you guys are doing, uh, have you guys seen, it doesn't look like there was much presented on uh, changes in, um, uh, in, in attention as a response to, to the intervention. Uh, have you guys looked at that in any detail? Have you looked at, uh, subgroups of kids with autism with comorbid ADHD. Just, I'd love to hear your thoughts there. Tom, go ahead. Sorry, I was muted. Um, we did, uh, in the previous study, look at the, uh, the Connors and in particular to see if there was any um, increases in hyperactivity. There really was no signal uh, to, because we were worried about that as well. Is that, are we gonna affect attention and focus? Um, and um, did not see any worsening of that, you know, across the two groups, but small numbers again. So we will be keeping track of that, especially with the ABC. So we'll have um, hyperactivity as a measure based on the, the Barron Behavior Checklist. Okay. All right. Well, I believe that's it in terms of the questions. Uh, Pramila, is it is it time for a break? Thank yeah. you guys. We will be taking a break till, I believe till three o'clock. Um, and then uh, start with one more presentation in the industry talks and then move on to more basic science. All right, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>